Belt Buckles and Bullets, an investigation into the Civil War era and habitation of the Forgeman's house at Catoctin Furnace. Catoctin Furnace occupies a central position to several major Civil War battlefields, including South Mountain, Antietam, Gettysburg, and Monocacy, revealing the relative importance of the Furnace's location during the conflict. The divisive position of Maryland as a border state between the United and Confederate States of America established small towns like Catoctin Furnace and Mechanicstown, now known as Thurmont, as important way stations for soldiers passing through these rural areas on their way to engage the enemy. The momentum of war carried both blue and gray soldiers through small towns like Catoctin Furnace, which were inevitably swept up in the conflict due to their location along major routes or at the nexus of several crossroads. One such small, sleepy Pennsylvania town was of relative unimportance until July of 1863, the town of Gettysburg. While small towns or villages like Catoctin Furnace may not have always directly influenced the outcome of the war itself, they certainly left an indelible mark on soldiers passing through them, as well as those people living and working in such places at the time. At the outset of war in the early 1860s, Frederick City and its surrounding environs, including Catoctin Furnace, became a focal point of both Northern and Southern sympathies. Maryland's important, although somewhat ambiguous, position as a border state exposed its Western counties to the constant threat of invasion, even early in the war. Following the Baltimore riots of April 1861 and the subsequent Union occupation of that city the next month, Colonel Bradley Johnson of the Confederate Army quickly worked to recruit volunteers to a Maryland line among the Southern forces. Most of these volunteers came from the southernmost portions of the state, and none of the family names traditionally associated with the Catoctin area were noted in a 1900 survey of the Confederate Maryland line. However, perhaps telling is the Union enlistment of Thomas Benner, shown here, a 24-year-old white male from Mechanicstown who initially signed on with the 1st Potomac Home Brigade Infantry before enlisting with Company K of the 13th Maryland Infantry on December 13, 1861. Benner would go on to become the furnace keeper at Catoctin following the war, according to his 1869 Frederick County marriage license. In September of 1862, approximately 50,000 Confederate soldiers crossed the Potomac River, singing Maryland, my Maryland, before moving on to occupy Frederick City. Pushed out of this political center of Frederick County later that same month, Confederate forces would move on from Frederick City to the battles of South Mountain and then Antietam. Hoping to call the citizens of Western Maryland to the Southern cause, Confederate soldiers were met with neither cheers nor songs, but self-evident pity, as one of the rebel occupants recalled. At this time, Catoctin Furnace was owned by John Kunkel and operated by his sons, John B. Kunkel and Jacob M. Kunkel, who would later come to own the family business. John Kunkel was an ardent, outspoken Southern sympathizer, campaigning for Southern Democrat John C. Breckinridge during the explosive election of 1860. As militarism became more evident in Western Maryland and, and Union soldiers targeted known Southern sympathizers, Kunkel's Frederick City home was searched to no avail. The soldiers found only a Confederate flag and a portrait of Jefferson Davis. Despite the Southern sympathies of Jacob Kunkel, slave labor was at an all-time low at Catoctin Furnace at the outset of the Civil War. While John B. Kunkel owned four slaves himself, all of them were under working ages. Indeed, 19th century slave labor at the Furnace had reached its height with 20 slaves in 1830. By 1841, the number of slaves working at the furnace had declined, as the owners at the time realized that the cost of housing and feeding slaves was more expensive than employing free white laborers for a working wage. In 1860, the census listed the furnace's value at $100,000, employing 90 men and producing 4,500 tons of pig iron annually. These numbers would continue to rise after the war to 9,000 annual tons of pig iron produced up through the early 1880s. Throughout the entirety of the conflict, the two furnace stacks owned by the Kunkel family were operational and in blast 24 hours a day. Employees were called working 10 to 12 hour shifts. In an oral history conducted in the 1920s, Catoctin Furnace resident Henry Fraley remembered that there were no hours, it was all day long, as long as you could stand. Fraley went on to describe the furnace village during the Civil War as a time of a working and a scotching, or working and drinking. Following the Battle of Antietam, Robert E. Lee's forces retreated south, leaving behind a vacuum of paranoia and restlessness. This tenuous peace did not last for long. In May of 1863, Lee began his second invasion of the North, which would end in the fields surrounding a quiet Pennsylvania town called Gettysburg. The Army of the Potomac quickly pursued the Confederate forces. In his memoirs, titled The Cannoneer, Augustus C. Buell, an artilleryman with John Reynolds' First Corps of the Army of the Potomac, recalls the last days of June 1863, when Union forces marched through the farmlands of Western Maryland in pursuit of the rebel army. 
Buell provides a unique insight into the morale and perceptions of the Union soldiers marching toward what they knew at the time would be an engagement against a vastly superior rebel force in a struggle which might end the war. And they all believe that if it went against us, that battle must terminate the conflict. Artillerymen in Buell's outfit, as well as soldiers in the Union force at large, seemed pitiful in the average sentiment of the rank and file of the glorious old Army of the Potomac at this time. The prevailing idea among the old soldiers was that the Army was being murdered by inches. During the march from Frederick, Union soldiers thought that the Antietam campaign, though fought on soil under Union control, was not regarded by the troops as really an invasion of the North. Maryland was more than half rebel anyhow, and none of the troops from the Northern and Western states had much sympathy with their people. However, Pennsylvania was held in altogether different estimation as Union land yet untainted by the Confederate Army. In addition to the psychological strain that leading elements of the First Corps experienced on the road to an engagement that every soldier knew would be a definitive, violent, and possibly final confrontation with a rebel army somewhere in Pennsylvania, on June 29, Buell's outfit received word that the commander of the Army of the Potomac was changing from Joseph Hooker to John Reynolds. Despite the wild enthusiasm that this announcement was greeted with, for no commander in any army ever had the respect and affection of his men to a greater extent than Reynolds, than Reynolds had of the men of the old first, this statement was in fact erroneous. Not Reynolds, but George Meade would be taking command of the Army of the Potomac, two days before the pivotal battle that would define the outcome of the war itself. On that same day, June 29, elements of John Reynolds' First Corps, initially amassed in Frederick City, began the forced and rainy 23-mile march to Emmitsburg. The Union soldiers passed through Adamsville, Lewistown, Catoctin Furnace, and Mechanicstown, each of which roused them with its flags and its cheers. From the farms along the road, women issued forth bearing pails of water and of milk, loaves of fresh bread, and cherries in abundance. Local tradition even holds that John Reynolds visited the Auburn House, an 1803 mansion near Catoctin Furnace constructed by one of its original owners. Reynolds would go on to be killed on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. On the 151st anniversary of Union forces passing through Catoctin Furnace, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Maryland Park Service, Cunningham Falls State Park, and Civil War Living History recreated the handing out of milk, bread, and cherries to soldiers in the First Corps of the Army of the Potomac. On June 28 and 29 of 2014, several volunteers gathered to recreate the display of loyalty to the Union that the villagers of Catoctin Furnace engaged in directly before the Battle of Gettysburg. These photos were taken outside of the Collier's log house, which is situated just to the north of the Forgeman's house. These same roads and thoroughfares were used in the aftermath of the Pennsylvania battle as well. On July 7, 1863, soldiers of the Sixth Corps marched through Franklin Mills, Mechanicstown, and followed the road leading directly to Tocton Furnace. Furthermore, local oral traditions maintain that stragglers from both the Union and Confederacy, trying to find their way home from the Gettysburg battlefield, were offered jobs at Catoctin Furnace. While the truth of this assertion has not been corroborated, other contemporaneous Maryland furnaces thrived during the Civil War. The Ashland Iron Works in Baltimore County went from 200 employees in 1860 to 250 by the conflict's end in 1865. In addition, employees of Horace Abbott's Mill in Baltimore City, perhaps most famous for producing rolled iron plates for the USS Monitor, were exempted from the draft, detailing the importance of iron working for the federal government during the Civil War. However, the situation at Catoctin Furnace appears to have been different. A comparative examination of payroll and store letters from 1863, 1864, 1882, and 1886 reveals that less than half the number of people were working in the village and frequenting the general store in the mid-1860s as compared to the 1880s. Pictured is an excerpt of the payroll and store ledger from 1882, showing Thomas Benner, the Union enlistee and furnace keeper. Catoctin Furnace's contribution to the war effort remains something of a mystery. A myth concerning Catoctin Furnace's involvement in the production of rolled iron plates for the Monitor has persisted since the 1940s, and possibly even earlier. In the 1990s, the National Park Service conducted a study of the contractors contributing to the iron plating of the USS Monitor and found only one non-New York contributing firm, Horace Abbott and Sons from Baltimore. However, Abbott's Mill did not produce iron, but rolled iron plates into finished products. Because of the lack of surviving documentary evidence from Horace Abbott and Sons, it is impossible to know how, who supplied them with the raw iron product that was then rolled into a finalized form for the Monitor. Catoctin Furnace made pig iron, which was not generally used by rolling mills in the 1860s, instead preferring bar iron for rolling into iron plates. In March and April of 2016, EAC archaeology ex excavated beneath the original floorboards of the circa 1820 Forgeman's house at Catoctin Furnace.
Among the thousands of artifacts recovered, an assemblage of 19th century military finds was encountered, including several artifacts dating tightly to the time of the Civil War. The bulk of the military assemblage were, was recovered from test units TU-3 and 4, as well as extensions of TU-4. Relevant finds from stratum 1 of TU-3, pictured here, include a two-piece cuff-sized brass button depicting a symmetrical spread eagle with a lion shield with a rough range of manufacture from between 1847 and 1880 as the central device. The shank is bent but still visible, and no back mark is evident due to the advanced corrosion of the button. Also encountered in TU-3 was a three-cent nickel piece dating to 1867 with a Liberty Head pattern that was first minted in 1865. The majority of military finds from the Forgeman's house derived from TU-4 and its extensions. Pictured here is the stratum 1 opening of TU-4. Another brass cuff size button was recovered from stratum 1 of TU-4, bearing a similar symmetrical spread eagle design with line shield device. Unlike the button previously described, however, the back mark on this example remains in good condition. This back mark, Scoville's and Co. Extra, dates from 1840 to 1850 and represents one of the primary producers of buttons for U.S. military uniforms before and during the Civil War, the Scoville Company, operating out of Waterbury, Connecticut. Also found here was a three-piece coat-sized brass button with the city seal of Philadelphia as the device and a clear back mark that reads Horseman Bros and Co. Phila. This back mark has a tight production range from 1859 to 1863 and may have been issued to members of a regional regiment or possibly regional militia, most likely from Philadelphia. Another two-piece coat-sized button was recovered from this context, bearing the device of a symmetrical spread eagle with line shield, again produced roughly between 1847 and 1880, with the back mark missing. A three-groove 58 caliber Gardner Manet ball of Union manufacture was also collected here, with rodent bite marks visible on the apex of the bullet, highlighting the rodent disturbance evident throughout the excavation, in addition to a brass die struck eagle hat rosette, also known as a shako plate which were produced as side plates for U.S. military issue hats from the 1830s through the 1860s. Here is a shako plate as it would have been worn in the relevant historical period. Several artifacts were recovered from the Western extension of TU-4. The stratum 1 opening of TU-4's Western extension is shown here. Finds from this context include an early copper alloy braided hair Liberty head one cent piece dating to 1847 from the first stratum. And a two groove 58 caliber Gardner Manet ball of possible Confederate manufacture from the second stratum. The first stratum of the Eastern extension of TU-4 shown here revealed two percussion caps, which were manufactured from 1820 onward, one in poor condition and the other relatively unscathed, with traces of fulminate of mercury used to ignite the cap still preserved. Also found with these percussion caps was a two-piece vest-sized brass button with a symmetrical spread eagle device bearing a shield inscribed with the Roman numeral one, indicating the infantry service. The back mark of this button was badly corroded, while the shank was present but mangled beyond further examination. Two more percussion caps were recovered from the third stratum of the eastern extension of TU-4. Two more buttons were collected from the first stratum of the second southern extension of TU-4, shown here. The first was a two-piece coat-sized brass naval button with the device of an eagle holding an anchor, an inscribed back mark reading R&W Robinson Extra, which dates from between 1836 to 1848. This button type was commonly used on naval uniforms during the Civil War, as the left fluke of the anchor is hidden behind the eagle's left wing. Buttons with the same device, but with the left fluke entirely visible, were used more commonly after the Civil War. Also found here was a three-piece domed bullet button with no back mark, the manufacture and production of which dates from between 1810 and 1832. Other significant Civil War-related artifacts found by EACA at and around the Forgeman's house include a Puppy Paul-style Union belt buckle dating from between 1839 and 1863. This find was recovered from the third layer of a feature in STPE2, pictured here, that was identified as a builder's trench, excavated sometime before the 1920s, when an addition was built on the eastern side or back of the stone house. Perhaps the most interesting artifact recovered 
from the excavations of the interior of the house was a brass hardy hat pin that was found in the first stratum of fireplace test unit 1.5. The Hardy hat pin, or Jeff Davis Eagle, was originally intended to serve as a pom-pom eagle on the model 1851 Shaco calf, which was replaced with the black felt Jeff Davis, or Hardy hat, in 1858. The name Hardy derives from William J. Hardy, an officer in the U.S. Army before the Civil War, who was responsible for the revision of many of its long-standing regulations, as well as an officer in the Confederate Army after Georgia seceded from the Union in 1861. Jefferson Davis was the Secretary of War in the late 1850s and was instrumental in the creation of cavalry regiments before the Hardy or Jeff Davis hat was approved for all branches of the U.S. military. The Hardy hat pin was used to attach the brim of the black felt army hat to the right side of the head for cavalry units and to the left side of the head for artillery and infantry units. Shown here is a Hardy hat pin in pristine condition. In conclusion, while the first strata of TUs 3 and 4, as well as the TU4 extension, were inflicted with heavy bioturbation in the form of rodent disturbance, there is nevertheless a concentration of 19th century military and Civil War era artifacts in the southern and southwestern sections of the Forgeman's house. This area of the house is part of its original construction, dating to around 1820. Furthermore, the entire assemblage seems to most likely be exclusively of Union manufacture, production, and use, with the possible exception of the two groove 58 caliber Gardner Rene Ball. As far as the villagers who lived and worked at Catoctin Furnace during the Civil War, it is clear that Union soldiers especially were greeted with celebratory displays of affection and goodwill as they marched through the small towns and the farmlands of Western Maryland as the perceived liberation force attempting to curtail a Southern invader. This directly contrasts with the apparent ambivalence and even animosity of small town villagers to Confederate soldiers who perhaps viewed the rebels as more of a foreign invasion force, as opposed to the liberating presence those gray soldiers imagined when they first crossed the Potomac singing Maryland, my Maryland.